Thanks for coming to our session. I'm Daniel Tonkalang. This is my colleague, Shuram Sankar. We're from LinkedIn. And this afternoon, we're going to talk to you about socializing search professionally. Now, hopefully, uh, most of you are familiar with LinkedIn. Perhaps you went to uh, some of the other talks in the sessions about it. But specifically, you know, on LinkedIn search, you know, whether you've been looking for you know, Apache committers um, or Apache commanders, right? We, we try to have a pretty wide swath of the professional universe. And uh, so I'm hoping that all of you are at least familiar at a basic level with LinkedIn search, whether it's for finding people, jobs, companies, universities, the content that we have. And uh, today, we're going to talk about some of the aspects of the quality search quality, as well as the, as the infrastructure underlying it. Now, uh, I realize uh, there was actually a, a tweet I saw earlier that uh, you know, not everybody's working in social networks and search. Uh, for sure, some of the things that we do uh, at LinkedIn for search are, if not unique to our platform, certainly highly relevant to a small set of folks working with very large scale social data where search is a key application. Uh, so I, I can't promise that everything we say will have applicability to all of your problems. But I do think that many of the ideas that we've been pursuing have broader applicability, both on the search quality side and on the infrastructure side. So certainly my hope that not only do you learn some of how we do things at LinkedIn, but also that you take away some ideas that are relevant perhaps a completely different uh, search or infrastructure application. And uh, hopefully it's, it's clear who is who from you know, your own internal classifiers for names. But I'm Daniel, and this is Sriram. And, and I'm going to first talk a bit about quality and then give the floor to him to talk about the infrastructure innovations we're doing uh, to make this all work. Now, LinkedIn search leverages what we call the economic graph, or our professional network. And I thought that uh, a couple of examples would illustrate what we mean here. So if you look at the example on the left, uh, you can see a search for director of data science. Now, it turns out that actually, and perhaps this is the reason why conferences like these are so successful, there are a lot of job openings for directors of data science. In fact, the first one is a listing at LinkedIn. We are trying to hire. So please let me know if you're interested. But um, we, if you look there at the, uh, the options, you'll see that we, the ranking of these reflects, and these are my search results, it reflects my connections to the companies or the people involved. So for example, uh, there's also an opening at Brightroll, where I can see a friend at Brightroll as a connection to the company. Or I have also connections to the person who posted the job. So this is, you know, if you think about this, this uh, use of network signals in search is really something fairly recent. Right? I'm seeing listings for jobs that are being ranked based on my connections to the people at the companies posting the jobs. This is not traditional information retrieval. Or if we look on the right, uh, I do a search for Kurt Brown. Now, there are a lot of Kurt Browns, but as it turns out, uh, there's only one who's actually here at Strata. And not surprisingly, that Kurt Brown is at the top of my list. He's second degree, which means that you know, he's a connection of a connection of mine. Now, that narrows it down, but it doesn't narrow it down completely. In fact, if you look at the Next several results, they're also named Kurt Brown, and they're also second degree. But the, I have more shared connections with him than with others. He's in the internet industry. There are a lot of, of threads that bring together uh, what you could call homophily, right? The, that similarity, either based on the network or based on what Kurt and I do, or even location, that are signals that this is likely to be the Kurt Brown that I met. And, uh, uh, I actually met him earlier today. I decided I would wait until after the talk to connect to him so that I could faithfully say he's still second degree. 
Now, this is about social search. And whenever you're searching in a social context, relevance is highly personalized. Maybe that was clear from the two examples I just gave. But I, I think a striking example is taking a search for architect. Now, perhaps everybody in this room would see the word architect somewhat the way that I do, right? An architect is a senior engineer or scientist, but it has something to do with, with software, at least. And sure enough, if you look at the million plus results for architect ranked for me, there are software architects, solution architects, and so forth. Now, my wife works in real estate. She also has a very clear idea of what architect means. Right? There are people who, I'd say there are people who build houses, but they're actually people who get paid to tell someone else to build the houses. But you get the idea. They're architects in the, the sense that most people outside this room, and perhaps outside of Santa Clara County, think of the word architect. Well, her results are completely different. There are people who are in the real estate industry or in uh, commercial and uh, domestic uh, real estate. Now, what's interesting here is that, you know, I think all of us are familiar with personalization to some degree. But typically, personalization is kind of a, a tweak. I mean, if all of us were to search for the word architect on Google or Bing or, or most search sites, there'd be some slight differences based on who we are, but not drastic ones. Here, the results are completely different. There's nobody in common between the results that she and I see, at least in the top ranked ones. And that's not because we do some kind of a word sense disambiguation that architect means something for me versus something for her. This is actually something that comes out because of all of the uh, the homophily signals I talked about a moment ago. I think this is striking. It, it has uh, implications for both infrastructure and quality that we have to assume that two different people, perhaps even two coworkers in the same field, uh, are likely to get uh, different results. And on average, two people for the same query may get completely disjoint results. Now, the search field, information retrieval in general, have uh, arrived at machine learned ranking, or some people may call it uh, learning to rank, or LIDAR, as kind of the main paradigm for how you do ranking. And uh, since I don't know the sort of how familiar different people are in this audience with machine learned ranking, uh, the very brief summary is that you have a bunch of training data, uh, typically based on either click behavior or on a sort of golden set of documents that people have found relevant for queries. And with these document query pairs, you can then get uh, a bunch of features that you associate uh, to determine you know, these are positive pairs, you know, here's, here are feature vectors for them, here are negative pairs. And using this, uh, there are many different variations of these models. You essentially get machine learned models that determine the relevance of a document given a query in terms of feature vectors. Now, the thing is, we just said, our results are highly personalized, which means that we really have to think of scoring the relevance of a document, not just relative to the query, but relative to the query and the user. And you know, the, uh, I think in our latest uh, uh, report, we said we have you know, over 277 million users. And as I just noticed, it's typically two different users will have completely different results. Now, uh, this is pretty challenging from a machine learned ranking perspective. Because if you say, well, no problem. We'll get training data for every user. And you know, I won't do all the math, but if you could think of getting thousands of training points and 277 million users, it's not, we really can't afford to do that. We're not going to get billions of training examples. You can imagine trying to uh, turn user features into query features, but this gets pretty tricky as an encoding. So sort of traditional machine learned ranking breaks down uh, in this highly personalized, highly user-centric context. So uh, we end up having to get explicit user features explicit query features, and we're certainly not in a position where we're going to have 
uh, human gathered curated data to determine uh, what are the, uh, the training examples. So we actually derive those training examples from user behavior. Uh, we use click data, we use non-click data, we also, uh, in order to get negative examples, essentially bootstrap our own, our, our own ranking algorithms to get uh, basically documents that get ranked towards the end as what we call easy negatives. Uh, I don't have the time to get into a, a full explanation of how we do that, but if you're interested, uh, I highly recommend a talk that uh, my colleague Shakti Sinha and I gave at the SIGIR uh, conference last year, uh, which is available online, uh, called uh, Find and Be Found. But okay, once we have these models, the question is how do we apply them? Now, given that we have many different kinds of queries, different sorts of users, uh, we, it's very tempting to just have a very complicated model. In fact, we, we use some, uh, a, a tree-based technique called additive growth, a sort of ensemble method, uh, to build very uh, precise models, but they were computationally tractable. Because one of the things with these scoring models is that we have to apply them to every result we return uh, when we're deciding how to score documents. So complex models that work extremely well. On the other extreme, we have logistic regression, a linear model. And that's very efficient to apply, but uh, it, it's not as expressive. Right? There, are, there are things that you lose when you move to a linear model in terms of essentially being able to encode conditionals or if-then-elses in the way your model works, the way that a tree does. So we did a compromise. And we built a tree, essentially a decision tree, whose leaves are logistic regression. And, uh, so we get the benefits of linear models at the leaves, and it turns out that uh, we experimented with this and turned out the document features, which are the most expensive to apply because they have to be applied to every result we return, are at the bottom, or they're in the leaves, in the regressions. But the tree looks at query and user features, which those are nice because we can compute those only once for a query, uh, and they also have an intuitive meaning that we're segmenting our models based on the features of you know, like the use case, if you will, which we can derive from the user in the query, while then doing the more expensive computation once we've established that at the level of individual search results. We actually have multi-level you know, L1 and L2 modeling if people want to go uh, into that to not evaluate all of our features for all scores, but essentially uh, we save regression for the, the heavy lifting at the end. Now, the uh, focus at LinkedIn is on entity-oriented search. And to us, entities are people, companies, uh, job titles. You can think of them as what you typically find in metadata, but you know, if you look at the structure of a LinkedIn profile and the kind of things that people query about, you know, the metadata is the data. This is sort of fundamentally what we work with. And it turns out that uh, understanding what the intent of a user is comes down to figuring out how that metadata works. So I used two queries here to illustrate how entity-centric our world is. And the queries superficially seem extremely similar. One is Edward Jones, and one is Ed Jones. Now, what's interesting is that we can determine that with very high probability, somebody entering Edward Jones means the company by that name, the financial services company, for those not familiar. And so we return at the top what we, a navigational result, uh, the company page, because perhaps that's what you want to go to. If you don't want to go to that, we show employees, people who work at Edward Jones, also jobs at Edward Jones. It's sort of a unified uh, search page trying to cover all the bases of what a user might have meant by that query. That's what's on, the, on your left. If you look on your right, you'll see that uh, Ed Jones is interpreted as a name search. Now here's the funny thing. If you look at the second result, it's somebody named Edward Jones. So we know that Ed and Edward are name variants, they're nicknames. 
So we were able to figure out that if you type in Ed Jones, it's much more likely you're looking for somebody named Edward Jones than if you typed actually in Edward Jones. Maybe counterintuitive, but the data bears it out. Now, you can make these queries explicit, but part of the job we're doing here is capturing the meaning to uh, make sure that it's the meaning that drives that search experience. And you can actually think of understanding the query as a kind of relevance filter. And what I mean by that is that in the traditional uh, modeling of search relevance, you basically look for all the documents containing the, all of the words in your query, or maybe you let some of them be dropped out. There are some variations of this, but it's a, a huge set. And there's no expectation that all of those documents are going to be relevant. That's what ranking is for. And you score, you score all of your results, and you put the top ranked ones, you know, and you hope that basically those are all the only ones that the user will see. And that's great, and it works pretty well in, uh, particularly in contexts where uh, there either there isn't a high degree of personalization uh, or for a variety of reasons, the, uh, uh, you're not going to be able to do much better in terms of, of, a, of having a filter because understanding the query is simply too hard. So it's, it's the best you can do. But we have this huge advantage. So when a query, for example, like LinkedIn CEO comes in, we put it through, uh, it's actually a hidden Markov model, so you know, my token code slide with, with uh, the Viturbi algorithm in there, that segments the query recognizes that, okay, there are two entities in there by our accounting, LinkedIn and CEO, tags them then, recognizes that LinkedIn is a company, CEO is a job title, and then can say, look, what we want are people here who uh, have LinkedIn as a company and CEO as a title. And that's how we'll find somebody like Jeff Wiener uh, as, as the top according to that interpretation. And we can use this interpretation to, as a strong boost to favor things that match it, or we can use it as an absolute filter. And in fact, the, uh, uh, there, there's actually a, a, a paper from some folks at MIT in the search literature called Less is More, but I think it's a general concept that uh, we can apply here. If somebody does a search for Warren Buffett, and, and he's on LinkedIn, you know, it's, uh, we, we try to have all the, all the world's professionals, uh, they probably don't mean people who have the words Warren and Buffett in their profile. Or I suppose you could also have Warren and Buffett in a job description, right? They're, they're, they're not looking for those words. They're looking for a person. They're looking for a person named Warren Buffett. And in fact, there is one result that matches that. Yeah. The Oracle of Omaha. In fact, uh, what's nice is that you might think it's kind of boring to only return one result, but we can pivot from that result to show other things you might be interested in, like Berkshire Hathaway or Bill Gates, who, as I understand, is now actually managing a Warren Buffett's money. The left-hand side here shows what might have happened if instead of taking advantage of our understanding of the query, we had relied entirely on uh, a machine learning ranking approach to get there. And the problem is, Warren Buffett is way outside of my network. Um, as I recall, his profile is not particularly complete. Let's face it, you know, he's kind of set when it comes to professional networking. So, um, so other people who are first degree for me, who are talking about Warren Buffett, can show up higher. And uh, so this is a case where if we know what the user means, then relying on scoring and ranking to get the matching results at the top, why should we? Why don't we actually apply our knowledge of what the user means as a filter and say, we'll cut out the rest? Now, you have to do that, of course, with, with carefully. I mean, if you make mistakes, you get very upset users. But uh, we've seen extraordinary lifts uh, in, in our metrics, uh, particularly in the, the click-through rates on top results, uh, when we use this sort of filtering, and uh, not at liberty to, to disclose them, but uh, th let's just say that in my, my past life when I worked at, at uh, a large local uh, web search company, 
I would have been happy to get one one hundredth of the sort of lift that we've gotten from filters like these. Now, uh, one thing which uh, I'd like to uh, give you a, a preview of today is where this emphasis on entities and sort of capturing user meaning goes. And this is what we're calling um, entity-driven search assistance. So imagine I start typing in L-I-N-K. We know uh, from, uh, from the sort of observing our queries that with very high probability, the user intends to type in LinkedIn. So we could just, and this, this is pretty common in search experiences today, we could have that string and say, okay, you click here, that's where you'll be. But the, um, we know a bit more than that. We know LinkedIn is a company. Uh, we have a standardized entity, right? It has a company page. There are jobs uh, associated with it. Uh, there are people who work there. In fact, if you look, we also know that LinkedIn and SlideShare are the same company, that LinkedIn has subsidiaries in other countries. So rather than have the user enter this search after they hit enter, uh, get a bunch of string matches, or maybe we filter those, we could actually say, look, we know what you mean, or we know, we know you mean LinkedIn, the company. We don't know whether you want to find people who work there, or people who used to work there, or jobs there. We can guess, and we can do far better than random, but why should we do a guess that is maybe 50, 60, even 80% right, when we can show three suggestions after somebody has typed in only a handful of characters, and then you know, like by the time you've actually gone to that results page on the bottom, uh, there's a transparency of intent. So this is the direction that, that we're going in. And the beauty of this is when you have structured data, this allows you to surface that structure early in the experience uh, to help users uh, express their intent. Uh, so with that, uh, I'd like to hand it over to Sriram, who's going to talk a bit about the infrastructure that makes this all possible. So I've been at LinkedIn for about uh, eight months now, uh, spending most of my time working on the new search infrastructure stack, which we need as our content is growing in size. We have a lot more members now than we used to. We have a lot more analysis that we can do. We have a lot more smarter engineers uh, who have joined the company and are capable of doing a lot of stuff. And our old stack just cannot scale for the kinds of things we need to do. So um, we're building something new. So just as before, everything that we're building going forward is still based on Lucene. How many of you have used Lucene or know about it? Just a show of hands. Okay, so it's a good crowd. So most of you know what it is, and so I can go a little faster in terms of describing what it is. But, but for the rest of you, I'll give you a quick overview. What it is, you know, if you, once you peel off all the layers, it's a map of terms that are present in documents to the documents themselves. So like, like a hash table, you can provide some strings and get a list of all the documents that string is present in. And furthermore, you can take combinations of strings, like give me all the documents with this string and this string and this string, or that string is present. So you can form queries that combine terms in different ways. Lucene provides you a couple of APIs. One is an API to add new documents along with all the terms that map to that document, and also remove old documents or remove documents that are no longer relevant from the index. So it provides you a way to keep the index up to date. It also provides you an API to query the index by providing it expressions using these terms. Quick example, suppose you, we have two documents. Let's suppose this is Daniel's profile on LinkedIn and my profile on LinkedIn. I'm just focusing on two terms out here, Daniel and Sriram, and also LinkedIn. Two terms per document. Ignore the rest. In a Lucene index, it would probably be represented in this manner. I like to represent inverted indices in the, using this structure. The horizontal lines are documents. The vertical lines are the lists of, the lists of um, documents that the term above it is present in. We call those posting lists. The green circles are what we call hits. So in this slide, the posting list for Daniel has a hit in document one. 
the posting list for Sri Ram has a link has a hit in document two, and the posting list for LinkedIn has a hit in documents one and two. So this is a very, very, very simple search index. Just to give you an idea of scale that we have to deal with. At LinkedIn, one of our more typical indices would have maybe hundreds of millions of documents, hundreds of millions of posting lists. So horizontal lines, hundreds of millions, vertical lines, hundreds of millions. The number of hits, that's the green circles you see here, are of the order of 10 billion, so in billions. The typical number of hits per document can be as little as 10 and can be as large as a few thousand. And the typical number of hits per posting list can be as small as one. For example, the posting list Tunkelang, I think it's still one. Um, and the posting list engineer might have millions. So you can, you can have posting lists that are as small as one element and as large as millions of elements. So that's the kind of scale we deal with. But all in all, this is past matrix. This is what the Lucene index is. Um, it's small in terms of other big data problems that you've been hearing about today, but it's big because this whole thing is sitting in memory and it's served directly out of memory for machine. No, there's, no, there's no disk access. Lucene also provides you the capability of adding metadata to the index. If it's uh, Without the metadata, you would probably not get very much by going to a Lucene index and querying. You'd only get document IDs and you'd have to find out more about the document IDs from elsewhere. So the, the metadata that can be stored in the index can be useful for whatever purpose you want it to be and Lucene allows you to store it there. Lucene also provides you a standard capability to score the document. But it's very difficult to, uh, sorry, it's, so, so you are able to build search engines really quickly in a matter of hours, you could get a search engine up and running using Lucene, using the default scoring capability it provides. But uh, unfortunately, it's very difficult to get sophisticated. So after a certain point, you hit the limits of what Lucene can provide you. You, uh, you can build a reasonably good search engine, but you cannot take it to the, to the, limits that we want to take it to. So comes our infrastructure. Here's a high level overview of what our infrastructure looks like. The index is Lucene. A lot of the other blogs over there are not. So some of the highlights of the infrastructure, we build our indices offline on Hadoop. We use Lucene APIs in Hadoop to end up with a Lucene index in HDFS. These indices from HDFS are shipped to our production machines, which serve the index as part of a search engine. Since our data is live, things change all the time, we need to enhance that index or ex uh, up keep updating that index with changes that are happening all the time. So we have a live update feed of deltas to the index that keep getting sucked in and the index remains fresh. The life of a query, when a request comes in, it goes to a component called a query rewriter that takes a raw query, input by the user, processes it, uh, in, in, a, in a bunch of ways, a lot of which Daniel talked about already, and out comes a structured Lucene query plus maybe some additional metadata. The structured Lucene query goes to the index and pulls out documents that match that index. Those documents are then passed on to another component called the scorer, which tags these documents with scores that describe the importance of these documents. Finally, it goes to another component called the sorter blender, which uses these score tags on the document to figure out what the top documents are to return to the user as resource. Sometimes there's an iteration, for example, uh, if you had a spelling error in your query and the resource that came out weren't adequate, you can do a repeat path with a more complex, more complex, more expensive, query writing and scoring process to correct spelling and uh, get enhanced documents uh, for, for that query. So um, this, is, this is what we do at a high level. I'm going to go through the individual pieces and get into some of the interesting details. The thing that you see in highlight in these uh, slides are, I would say, the significant takeaways from this presentation. Uh, it's a sneak preview today. Uh, we'll get into far more detail in a few months. And so 
the index that we build is a Lucene index. We store inverted indices, the forward index, and we also have the ability to order the documents. You, you saw my slide where, where the horizontal lines and vertical lines. The documents are horizontal lines. We have the ability to order these documents from the most important document to the least important document static, you, by a static determination. We call that the static rank. Page rank is an example of static rank. So on Hadoop, we have some relevance code that figures out which of our documents is the most important and all the, all the way to the least important. And we, we get to sort the whole thing in that manner. The, ni the nice thing about this, which you'll get to in more detail later, is that when you do the retrieval in Lucene now, you get the documents in order of importance. You get the documents um, in a, uh, from, the, from, from an important document downwards, and you don't have to retrieve every single document that matches your query. You can stop. That stopping is called early termination. Think of this as a lightweight scoring process. The static rank gives you a first level scoring. So it, now you can apply a far more expensive score that can get you a lot more bang for the buck on that limited set of documents. Otherwise, you'd have to go through the entire index, through all the documents that match, to, to, um, to get the top document. And your score, therefore, cannot be as detailed as you can have it with early termination. So our offline index builds, as I said, are on Hadoop. We built a framework where it's very easy to describe the index building process uh, through schemas and through MapReduce jobs. You can build it as a staged process. You can have intermediate tables. You can deter, you can depend on tables generated by other teams. At the end of this pipeline comes the Hadoop index. And it's very, very easy to incrementally make changes to the index. Tomorrow, if I want to add something that is not in the index, it's as easy as adding a new Hadoop job just for that part of the data and then updating a schema. So that gets sucked into the index. It's very easy to keep changing the index, which is a big problem that we've had in the past, where we relied on Lucene's APIs directly to just keep throwing documents into the index. One of the things that our offline process also does, which is something that is outside of Lucene, is it, it provides, it produces data models like language models for the query rewriter. The query rewriter step is the step that takes in the raw query and produces the rewritten query and other information. It can benefit from having models that are built offline. And what happens during the index building step, in addition to producing data that is the Lucene index, also produces data that can be used by the query rewriter. OK, uh, live data updates. So as I said, if you build indices on Hadoop, we typically build it once a week, maybe. Um, could build it once a day. The index that I talked about with those hundreds of millions of documents and so on, take us about 45 minutes to build. So it's, so it's not inconceivable to build it every day. We build it once a week. But we need to keep that index up to date between index builds. And so we have this partial update framework. Now, Lucene has a problem. All Lucene allows you to do is add a new document and delete an old document. Suppose when I, when I joined LinkedIn from Facebook, I changed my company from Facebook to LinkedIn. Up, let us say, a thousand terms that match my document, I just changed one. If I had to add a new document corresponding to me and delete the old document corresponding to me, it is a 2,000x or 1,000x times, it's 1,000 times more complex than, you than it has to be in terms of the update. So that's one problem. So it's, uh, the way Lucene allows you to do updates is very costly. We really can't afford to do it with the rate of updates we have. Number two, Lucene doesn't let you find out what these other 999 values are. Lucene is an inverted index. You can go from the terms to the document. You can't go from the document to the terms. So if you want to delete the existing document and add a new copy of it with one field change, you had to maintain a totally separate store from where you get those existing 999 documents, which adds a major amount of complexity. So that doesn't work very well. And third, what happens is that the static rank order gets messed up if you let Lucene do this, uh, adding and removing documents. So we've built this framework, which is a simple add-on to Lucene. 
works really well, still has a few bugs. We need to clean it up before we can share it with everybody, which we will eventually do, uh, which can take Lucene and extend it very easily to just update your index one field at a time. OK, so last few slides. Uh, query writing and planning, as I said, it takes a raw query and metadata from the user. So as Daniel said, it's personalized. So you, we take the user information, such as their ID, their connections, the time of day, what their last few searches might have been, and what, you know, what their background is, and so on. We take all that information. We take all the data models generated in the offline process. We put all these things together along with the raw query and figure out what the intent of the user is, produce a Lucene query as the output, and produce some metadata on top of that to help the scoring process that happens uh, in, in, the, in the subsequent step. When we take this Lucene query that was built by the rewriter, we send it to the index, we retrieve those documents. The documents are retrieved in static rank order. We can early terminate the retrieval, as I said, so we can, instead of, instead of retrieving all the, say, tens of thousands of documents that match, we could probably stop at a thousand. And the, the idea here is that the static rank is generally going to be very correlated to the final dynamic rank. It's not always going to be exactly the same, but we can hope that from the top 1,000 documents, you will get the top 20 documents for every single individual who's performing the search. The, re the query is also rewritten differently for different users, so if all the users don't get the same top 1,000 documents. So the, re the, the rewriting process is also social. The top 1,000 documents that Daniel gets and I get are going to be different. Okay, the other thing to keep in mind is, as I said, Lucene has a built-in scoring capability, which works very well if you just start using Lucene. You can get up to speed really, really quickly and build a search engine in hours. But if you want to build a complex search engine which takes advantage of a, of, of a lot of uh, technology that has been around for a while, uh, Lucene uh, uh, you know, comes in the way in some sense. So, so what we've decided to do is absolutely no scoring in Lucene. We only use Lucene for index storage and retrieval. We perform the scoring as a separate component outside of Lucene. And now we can apply all our techniques, uh, machine learning tools, and whatever else we have uh, in an extremely flexible manner. And finally, scoring. Scoring, as I said, performed after retrieval. Uh, again, it can use complex features that we calculate in Hadoop. We use the metadata about the user that comes down from the rewriter, put them all together, out comes the sequence of scores. So this is my last slide, and uh, we'll summarize the talk now. Yeah, we just wanted to make sure that you get the, the takeaways we think are most useful. So I'll summarize on the quality side that you know, we use the economic graph, we use the sort of network connections uh, for all of our uh, both understanding and ranking. That look, when you when you have social search, relevance is going to be highly personalized, which uh, as Sri has, has described, has a lot of infrastructure implications as well as ones for the way you train machine learned systems, and uh, that entity. I use the use of entities, and even more broadly than entities, the notion of a relevance filter that uses the understanding of the query to eliminate irrelevant results is it, something hugely useful, so much so that we're moving in a direction where we're trying to move that into suggesting structured queries that capture the user's intent. And from the infrastructure side, it's powered by Lucene. It's based on Lucene, but it's got a bunch of other components such as query rewriting, offline, scoring outside Lucene, and so on. Uh, partial updates has been, in some sense, ex an extension of Lucene, which is still within LinkedIn, but hopefully we'll share it sometime soon. Uh, we build indices offline in Hadoop. We used the concept of static rank and early termination. As I said, we do scoring outside Lucene, and we have other components like query rewriting that also sit outside Lucene. Any questions?